I'd like to welcome everybody to our discussion of the Book of Mormon today. Uh, we'll be talking about the contents and the structure of the Book of Mormon. Uh, my name is Andy Hedges, and I'm joined with my colleagues Keith Wilson, Todd Parker, and Steve Harper. We teach in religious education at Brigham Young University. Brethren, um, what we're going to talk about today, we'd, we'd like to provide a, a, a comprehensive overview, kind of of the structure of the Book of Mormon. Uh, the plates, as, as you read the Book of Mormon, there are numerous plates that are mentioned in there. And uh, Mormon gives some pretty specific uh, details about how he puts the Book of Mormon together and what his sources are and things like that. But it can be very confusing uh, when, you, when you try to, to put it all together in your own mind. And so it would be very helpful for all of us, I think, to just, to just kind of lay it out literally on the table and uh, see, see what we've got here. Todd, could I turn it over to you? You seem to have okay. ob obtained some permissions and <laughs> have some pl yeah. plates here for you us. Help me set those up. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Book of Mormon, uh, the front pages aren't numbered, but two pages prior to uh, First Nephi, there's a page that says a brief explanation about the Book of Mormon. It lists the plates that we've got uh, uh, depicted here. And so uh, what we want to do is just, uh, what I'd like to do is just ask the question, uh, which plates did Joseph Smith actually take with him from the hill? I think a lot of people may find that a little confusing. And the plates Joseph actually took from the hill are the plates of Mormon or the gold plates with the small plates attached to them. He didn't have these other plates. He didn't have the plates of brass or the large plates or the plates of ether with them. So just to uh, kind of explain what you see on this page here, uh, uh, the, the brass plates are the ones that uh, uh, they went back to get in Jerusalem and they, they uh, uh, Laban lost his head over. And so then the small plates uh, were, well, the, the large plates were made first, right after they arrived in the Promised Land about 590 B.C. Twenty years later, then the Lord said, make another set of plates, and, and uh, Nephi made the small plates. The plates of ether come in later in the narrative. We find out that uh, <clears throat> uh, this is about the Jaredite civilization that is the earliest civilization. They kept a record, and then it was found by the people of uh, Limhi, then brought back to Messiah II, and then passed down. So if, if I were Mormon then, I would have all of these plates, and, and these would have come down through uh, time. Mormon was born around 300, 310 AD. Then he makes his own set of the plates of Mormon that he talks about uh, in the record. So these are the, the plates of Mormon are the gold plates. <clears throat> and so how our record is put together today is Mormon on his plates makes an abridgment or a summary of uh, mainly from the large plates. He, uh, he abridges the large plates. He said he puts one one-hundredth part of what's on the large plates onto the gold plates. Then uh, at, in 385, when the last battle happens and he's ready to hand the record over to his, uh, his son Moroni, the Lord says, uh, <clears throat> I want you to attach the small plates to the uh, gold plates. And so he, uh, there's a record called the, uh, the Words of Mormon, and that's just his explanation in between the plates of Mormon and the small plates of why he's attaching them. So then as Joseph, and, and for our purposes, we'll put the small plates on the bottom, Joseph starts to translate this record, and he's translating from the gold plates, which is an abridgment from the large, starts with Lehi in 600 BC, and it goes down from 600 to 130 to the time of King Benjamin. Through some events we'll explain a little bit about later, that gets stolen, and Joseph, beside himself, the Lord says, don't retranslate this. Uh, some evil people have stolen that. They think you'll retranslate it. They've altered it. When you bring it forth, they'll show they don't match, and they'll make you look like a fraud. He said, but I plan for this. This is what happens when you're dealing with an omniscient being. Uh, he says, I had uh, Nephi make a second record, and guess what? It covers the same period of time. This goes from Lehi down to Benjamin from 600 to 130 B.C. And so you use that and replace what was stolen. So in our book today, we have uh, the first part of the Book of Mormon. Uh, first Nephi goes from First Nephi down to uh, <clears throat> Omni. 
that's first person directly from the, the small plates. And then you have the Words of Mormon. If you look at the bottom of um, the, the last page of Omni, it's 130 BC. Then you look at the Words of Mormon, it's 385 AD. And then the first page of the Book of Mosiah is 130 BC again. So this is 500 years out of context, just explaining why he put them together. So then uh, you've got that uh, uh, explanation here. And then over here, if you, if you look at the listing of books from 1 Nephi down to Omni, that's a direct translation from the small plates. Then you've got the Words of Mormon written in 385 AD. Then from Mosiah down to 4 Nephi is Mormon's abridgment of the large plates. Then the Book of Mormon is Mormon adding a little more, gives the record to his son Moroni. Then the Book of Ether is Moroni summarizing the, the plates of Ether. And then Moroni adds his little bit and then, uh, then that ends the record. So uh, I think a way, if you don't have all these boxes, to help you uh, see it is uh, if, you, if you go in your Book of Mormon to the Book of uh, Omni, and maybe the brethren here could do the same thing. Uh, Jacobinus Jerem Omni, it's on page uh, 140. And you hold that in your left hand. <clears throat> or let's see, we'd go up to page 142. Leave the words of Mormon there and then hold the rest in your right hand. Brethren, what have we got in our left hand there from 1 Nephi to Omni? It's Joseph's translation of the small, small plates of It's direct yeah. translation and it's first person. I Nephi, I Jacob, I Enos, I Jerem. Now what have you got in your right hand? Got Joseph's translation of Mormon's abridgment, abridgment yeah. of the yeah. large yeah. plates. Of the large plates, and it's yeah. in third person. So he's saying King Benjamin did this or whatever. And so, and then what is that one page in the middle? <laughs> that's Mormon's connective tissue of the yep, two that's, kinds of That's plates. the bridge, <laughs> that's between, the bridge yeah. uh, between these. Now, uh, one thing I might add just before we move the plates, uh, the, uh, the plates of brass that they went back to Jerusalem to get, uh, Joseph didn't have, but some of that was copied onto the small plates. That's where we get the Isaiah chapters and the, uh, <clears throat> also the allegory of, uh, of uh, the tame and the wild olive uh, trees came, came from here, and the writings of Zenic and Zenus came from here. So that's just a big picture, and then I think we'll go back and talk about each set of plates and the time periods they cover. So just to clarify, Mormon never abridges the small plates. He attaches them, as near as we can tell, That's bodily right. to they're, his abridgment. They're attached to the plates of Mormon or the gold plates. And they cover the same period of time that the first part of Mormon's abridgment of the large plates covers. Yeah, the, the 116 handwritten pages that were stolen, Right. Uh, it covers that same period of time because the Lord Enos prayed and worried that something had happened. The Lord promised Enos that we'd have the record. And so the Lord, to keep his promise to him and others, inspired Nephi. He had already started the large plates. Mm -hmm. 20 years later, he says, now make another record. And, and he can't just go down to the store and buy plates. Uh, this is a big deal. And he says, well, I'll do it. Uh, it's for a wise purpose. And he didn't know what the purpose was. So he made the second set, and that has the religious information. Uh, and that replaced the abridgment of the historical one, and in section, uh, section 10 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says, basically, your replacement is better than what they stole. Okay. okay and very let helpful. me read a slice from Go the ahead. preface of the 1830 edition. Joseph wrote this preface to explain some of this, especially the loss of the, of the first uh, 116 pages of manuscript. That is, pages of paper, not plates. Right. 116 pieces of paper that he had filled with writing. Martin Harris had been the scribe. And what it was, he tells us, I would inform you that I translated by the gift and power of God and caused to be written 116 pages, the which I took from the book of Lehi, which was an account abridged from the plates of Lehi by the hand of Mormon. So uh, we had the, uh, the book of Lehi, which Mormon had abridged, which was on the uh, the uh, you've got the book of this part here. <laughs> yeah, it was on the plates of Mormon. Okay. We no longer have that. This replaces it. So then, am I right in from what you're saying that the book of Lehi that was lost contained more than just Lehi's right. 
writings or, or an abridgment of Lehi's writings? Well, I would say that the 116 pages that were lost contained more contained than more just an abridgment. Than that. It of contained Lehi's writings. from Lehi down to the commencement of the reign of King Benjamin, which is several hundred years of history. It, it contained the secular history yes. that uh, took place at the at the same time, we've got the prophets Nephi, Jacob, Enos, Jeremiah, Omni, and the others. Well over 400 years. Writing, well over 400 years of material. In Doctrine and Covenants section 10, the Lord says, pick up where you left off at the beginning of the, of the Book of Mosiah, about where King Benjamin's reign right. starts. So it's titled the last pages of the Book of Lehi, but it's really Contains Lehi, far Nephi, more. Jacob and and the, the kings, the kings that were down to the time of Benjamin. We're doing that. Since we're talking about years, it might help just to to give a, a, a big picture here. The the plates of brass here covered from the beginning, which would be somewhere around 4,000 B.C. down to the time of Jeremiah, that would be 600 B.C. And then the plates of uh, ether, uh, they they go from the time of the Tower of Babel, which would be about 2,000 B.C. down to the time of Coriantum. We don't know maybe 200 B.C. or so. Then the, uh, the large plates, they go from, they were begun in 590, and they go down to the, the last battle in about 385. And then, A.D., that is. A.D., Begun 590 right. B.C. and 320 Yeah, it was about 1,000 years. years. Yeah, history. and then the, uh, the small plates, they, uh, they were begun after the large, and they go from about 570 down to King Benjamin at about 130. And then the plates that Joseph got, the, the gold plates, uh, Mormon didn't live till about 300, so they're made sometime after that, and they're the compilation of, of all these, and they were buried in 421 okay. A.D. Very helpful. Keith, could you talk about um, kind of the contents of the large plates, just a brief uh, what we know was on the large plates? Sure. We've got them right here. Let's open them up. <laughs> Easy to do. Uh, yeah. Um, Nephi, from time to time, will pause in his writing and just comment on this phenomenon that he's keeping two records. Uh, it's pretty apparent that he himself does not fully understand why, and he wants his readership to, to know that he's keeping these other records also. One of the best passages is in 1 Nephi chapter 9, uh, and he's, uh, Nephi is very consistent in kind of the pronouns uh, that he uses uh, to describe his, the large plates versus the small plates. And the large plates are always uh, referred to as the other ones, okay? Uh, the one that he's not writing on because see, we're reading in his writings from the small plates. So in the small plates, he's describing the large plates. Uh, verse two is a good verse to start with. Um, this is 1 Nephi 9, verse 2. And now, as I have spoken concerning these plates, behold, they are not the plates upon which I make a full account of the history of my people. For the plates upon which I make a full account of, the, of my people, I have given the name of Nephi. Wherefore, they are called the plates of Nephi after mine own name, and these plates are also are called the plates of Nephi. Okay. There's where it gets confusing. Right, and so he says these, but if you just right. keep that the these as, are being, the critical thing. Uh, uh, as being d very descriptive. So he says, I've written these other ones, and they give a, make a full account, is what he says in verse 2. Down in verse 4 he says, and upon the other plates, he keeps that same dichotomy, should be engraven an account of the reign of the kings and the wars and contentions of my people. Wherefore, these plates are for the more part of the ministry. So there he divides them. And his express uh, statement is that the large plates then contain the history uh, and the uh, accounts and the king's uh, contentions of my people. So that would then uh, say that from the original book of Lehi down through 4th Nephi, those are all uh, accounts coming from, uh, you might say, the fuller record, the things that keeps track of dates, keeps track of wars and contentions, who is king, and those things, all right? Now, we might just add verse 5. He said, Wherefore the Lord hath commanded me to make these small plates for a wise purpose in him, which purpose I know not. So that was a test of Nephi's faith. 
He made yeah. these small plates. He didn't know what the wise purpose was, but we understand from the events that transpired, the wise purpose was to have the small plates replace the lost or the stolen 116 pages. But Nephi didn't know why. He just did it mm -hmm. out of obedience. Then a thousand years later, Mormon says the same thing in uh, the Revelation. He gets to take Nephi's small plates and hook them to his abridgment of the large plates. I don't know why. It's the Lord's purpose, and so uh, the omniscient Lord provides for us a, a wonderful Book of Mormon, despite the actions of Joseph Smith and Martin Harris, plus the conspirators who stole the pages right. from them. Right. What would you add, Todd, to a description of the small plates? I mean, we've got so the large plates being history, um, history wars, secular history kings. type of things about the kings and maintained by the secular leaders. Small plates, then? Well, the kings basically kept the, uh, uh, this record, and then the, the, the prophets kept this one. And, and one thing, uh, again, if we go to uh, 1 Nephi chapter uh, 19, uh, <clears throat> notice the date at the bottom of the page. It's about 590 B.C. This is when he's told to make the second record. See, in 1 Nephi 19, it came to pass, the Lord commanded me, wherefore I did make plates of ore, that I might engrave upon them the record of my people. And upon the plates which I made, I did engrave in the record of my father. Skipping to verse 2, I knew not at the time what a, that I made them that I should, should be commanded of the Lord to make these small plates. He was referring to the large. Right. Wherefore, the record of my father, the genealogy of his fathers, the more part of the proceedings in the wilderness are engraven upon those first large plates of which I have spoken. Wherefore, the things which transpired before I made these small plates are of a truth more particular made mention upon the first plates or the large plates. Right. Then he adds to that, and after I'd made these small plates by way of commandment, I, Nephi, received a commandment that the ministry, prophecies, more plain and precious parts of them should be written on these small plates. The things which were written should be kept uh, for the instruction of my people. So these are small, those are large, uh, in the record up till the time of Omni. If our viewers are bewildered at this point, uh, <laughs> let's notice that the Book of Mormon itself is clear on this. Uh, it's, it keeps track of these plates with really good clarity. Mm -hmm. if, if it's hard for us to keep track of it or explain it, that's not the fault of the book. Let's ask if Joseph Smith is the author of that. It's way too complex and it's, yeah. a, it's always internally consistent. The, the book does never make a mistake about confusing these plates or what comes from them. Joseph Smith is the translator of the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. by no means the creator of it. And an interesting fact about that is it's, they, they joke about it. Mark Twain joked about uh, if the Book of Mormon, if you took it, came to pass, that would be reduced to a pamphlet. But <laughs> the phrase, it came to pass, is used 198 times from 1 Nephi 1 to 2 Nephi 5.30 because he's writing about the past. And then he's caught up to date. And from 2 Nephi 5.31 to the end of 2 Nephi, he never uses it came to pass. And the same is true with uh, uh, Moroni when he's abridging the, the, the plates of ether, when he's doing the past stuff, he says it came to pass, but then you get to his writings, he doesn't use it came to pass because it's up to date. It's current events. It's, it's, it's consistent internally. He hadn't looked very, Twain hadn't looked very closely at it, uh, <laughs> did he? I mean, when he refers to it as chloroform in print, uh, um, I've always thought to myself, if he would have looked far enough in there to find a book of ether, he might have gone ballistic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm struck too with, uh, when, when Mormon explains uh, in, in the words of Mormon kind of what he's doing, he says that he, here's our, here's our large plates, he says he, he abridged from the large plates from the beginning, the Nephi started, down to the, reign of, uh, to the commencement of the reign of King Benjamin. And then he basically says, if I can, let's, let's turn there here, words of Mormon, it's so small it's easy to lose. About page 143 or so. Yeah, there we go. Um, in verse 3, he says, I, I made an abridgment from, from the beginning of these large plates down to where uh, the reign of King Benjamin started. And then I searched among the records which had been delivered into my hands, and I found these plates, again, the small, these plates. small plates. He didn't even know he had them. He, he apparently has you know, inherited some sort of an archive of a thousand years worth of history here and something tipped him off as he was doing the abridgment 
that there's there's maybe another uh, an important little record that he hasn't uh, come across and so he he basically took a break and he looked around and then he says I found them I didn't even know I had them and I read them he goes on to say uh, you know, in verse 4, the things which are upon these plates pleasing me because of the prophecies of the coming of Christ. He says they were wonderful. And then the Spirit told me to take these small plates that I had just found and just read. I didn't know I had them before this. And put them with the abridgment that I'm creating. And then he continues on his merry way to the end. It's quite the process, isn't it? It really is. And, and you, see, you see inspiration happening when it needed to happen kind of throughout what the process. I, what I hear then is that Nephi composes what he does and uh, uh, when he does because the Lord reveals to him to do so. So does Moroni and compiles as he does. Yeah. I want to then, in other words, attribute the authorship of the Book of Mormon to the Savior. That would be a good way to do uh, it. He's definitely editor-in-chief. We could maybe give him that title. Yeah. The Book of Mormon is the most self-conscious book I've ever read. By which I mean to say it's very purposeful. The authors, the writers of it, the compilers of it, they know what they're doing. They know they're doing it because the Lord has directed them to do so. It's a very purposeful book. Its purpose is to bring us to Christ, to persuade mm -hmm. us that Jesus is the Christ and that they knew many years before his coming that he was so. And it seems to me a masterpiece. Yeah, yeah that's interesting, the self-conscious book notion. Uh, even those writers that were doing uh, a pretty minimal job in these small little books, mm -hmm. each one of them report, well, I just got it and I watched the other guy write it uh, and I don't have much to say and I'm passing it on. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, a, it's very upfront about what they're doing. The, the main engravers all tell us that they've prayed that these things and obtained a promise from the Lord that these records of theirs would reach their descendants. Mm -hmm. They've envisioned that that will come to pass, that they'll come forth through the Gentiles and make their way safely to their descendants. They've all got a guarantee from the Lord that that will happen, and yet the Lord has to preserve individual agency. Joseph Smith has to be free to hand over these pages to Martin Harris, which he does. Mm -hmm. And so we see the Lord using his omniscience to preserve agency and still keep his promises to the Book of Mormon peoples. And some theologians would say, if there is omniscience, if God's, if, if he knows all, there's really no such thing as individual agency. What the Book of Mormon shows us is that it's just there the is. opposite. That by knowing all, my works and plans and purposes can't be frustrated. Including agency. Indeed. Uh, in there. Another thing that's, that's really amazing is we were reading from Words of Mormon, and when he gets to verse 5, you hear a verse often repeated, he says, I cannot write the hundredth part of the things of my people. So for every 99 things he left out from the large plates, he puts in one, and President Benson continually reminded us we should read it and say, he who had seen the future, why did he leave out that and why did he put in this? So we have, for the most part, one one hundredth part of what was in the record. Mm -hmm. And people who get a little critical of the idea of, well, where is this, where, you know, where are these lands? Uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, it could be in Central America. I was down there sitting on top of a, a temple, and the guide there told me that they had only excavated 1% of the, of the ruins. And so if we have 1% of the record and 1% of the ruins, that sounds a whole lot like a 10,000-piece puzzle, and we got two pieces. Yeah. And the motive is to teach that Jesus is the Christ, not to give us geography and not to, to do all this history stuff. Yeah. It's to bring people to Christ. That's, that's a significant point. We have so much. I mean, you've, you've laid them out here, all of, these, all of this source material. And what, I mean, we use the word abridge. Mormon abridged the plates. but looking at the, the bigger picture, why he abridged them, what, what it was he extracted from a thousand years of history, it, it's, it's distilled down to the best stuff. I mean, he had at his fingertips all sorts of things to pick from, and he chose the, the better part. A great representation of that is Nephi's process, because he's largely going through a process similar to Mormon, mm -hmm. in that he's also trying to condense things down in his small plates, because he's already written the other record, and he's kind of been commanded to do something a little different. 
and as he distills it down, one of the great verses I love, just about his purposes in writing is he, in chapter four there, he just says in verse 15, mm -hmm. and upon these I write the things of my soul. Yes. And many of the scriptures which are engraven upon the plates of brass, for my soul delighteth in the scriptures. And then he goes on, behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord. Just yeah. like you said, Stephen, it's just, it's so Christ-centered, you know, and the thing that's pervading Nephi's uh, reason for doing this whole thing. Notice too that Mormon's editorial intent is to emphasize Christ. He, he selects King Benjamin's Christ-centered discourse. Certainly, yeah. He selects Abinadi's teachings. In fact, the, the last words that we hear from Abinadi's mouth as Moroni or as Mormon uh, make sure they get on the plates is teach them that redemption coming through Christ the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a Christ-centered book. And then Nephi himself, uh, 1 Nephi chapter 6, verse 4, mm -hmm. the fullness of mine intent is that my persuade men to come unto the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob and be saved, and that is Jehovah or the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the fullness of his intent. And that's how the Book of Mormon begins, and that's how it ends. And that's what you find throughout uh, the whole thing. One non-Latter-day Saint scholar wrote, the Book of Mormon is Christ-centered to a fault. <laughs> and I wonder how that can be. Yeah, that's uh, a pretty good fault. But it? It it's through. revealing though, isn't it, that, that non Latter-day Saints who have an eye to these things, when they read them, they too notice that Nephi and Moroni and Mormon, they were intentionally, their, their purpose, their intent was to teach of Christ, prophesy of Christ, bring their children to Christ through, through their writings. Yes. Well, brethren, thank you very much. Uh, very helpful, and I, I, it's cleared up some things for me. Uh, hopefully everybody else as well. Thank you.